My name is Vicky McGuinness and I work at the University of Oxford and I have the, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I get paid to do something that I love to do, uh, so don't tell anyone, but I really would do it for free. But actually, my job is to work with amazing researchers uh, that work in the Humanities Division and we're sharing with you some of the sort of public type activities that they do. Um, so where I work is called TORCH, it's the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities and um, funnily enough, a lot of our events are linked to uh, eating lunch, but also socialising and opening up research to lots of different public audiences. Um, so it, it <coughs> shouldn't surprise you that we've started with food today. Um, and it's also an absolute pleasure to be able to introduce a wonderful colleague, JC Nyala. JC is researching in, uh, she's doing her DPhil at the moment and is working also in the School of Anthropology and Museum Ethnography. Um, and a lot of her work is also performative. She's an award-winning uh, performer and writer. And what she's going to share with you uh, starts with this. So it's thanks to her. Thank you, JC, for our lovely uh, tidbits here today. Um, <laughs> Um, a really interesting fact that JC shared actually was only 1% of Oxford's food is estimated to come from local direct sources, which is shocking. Um, but actually everything you've just sampled here is local. So this is, it, it can be done and deliciously. Um, and when we sit down for a home cooked meal, we don't always think of it as exotic. And this is something we're gonna learn a little bit more about today. So come and experience local dining and we'll find out why, what category of plant you are, can be a matter of life or death. So please welcome JC. So hello everyone. Today's little dramatization comes from the world of anthropology. Now anthropology, for those of you who may not know, is a social science that helps us to make sense of the world. My research area is the city of Oxford, where I study gardeners and gardening. And so my performance today will be split into two parts. The first part is to give you a taste, and as you'll know, some of it's been quite literal, of a tool that anthropologists use, which is called ethnography. Now, when anthropologists write an ethnography, they try to describe people, their places and cultures in ways that create a web of meaning. Now, I'm quite a literal person, so when I do my ethnographies, this is what I do. I invite people to literally taste the city that they're experiencing. So for that reason, that's why you started off with food and drink, which as Vicky said, is all 100% local. And please feel free at the end of the evening, there's more strawberries to, to, you know, for you to help yourselves. So while you are still nibbling, I'm going to read you a portrait of Oxford, which forms part of the ethnography, which I wrote as part of my research when I had to present um, what the city of Oxford is like. It's a poem because there are just some cities which are very poetic and Oxford, I believe, is one of them. And the epigram of the poem comes from Matthew Arnold. I believe that a lot of you will recognize one of the lines. The second half of my performance is actually incredibly lighthearted. Um, I have to do a lot of serious academic writing and so it is kind of the complete antithesis of that. So please take it in that spirit. But the topic itself is actually still quite serious. And as Vicky said in the introduction, it is a matter of life and death. I'm also producing a podcast at the moment called Urban Garden Food. And on your chairs, you may have found a little card about that. So if anything that I say today interests you, please do get in touch and join in the conversation. But finally, before I start, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Vicky, Lydia, Hannah, Torch, Peter, Peter, Kaya, Ayana, Amber, Nara, and all of the people at the Offbeat Festival, the wonderful tech, for their support. I hope you have a lovely evening. Oxford, Cultura, the epigram. The veil, vale, the three lone weirs, the youthful Thames. This winter eve is warm, humid, the air, yet soft as spring. The tender purple spray on cops and briars, and that sweet city with her dreaming spires. She needs not June for beauty's heightening. And now the poem. Cross the Thames streams into my illusion center. There's no university here that tourists come to see. 
Tourists who jostle alongside dreams, laid in thinly iced gatto, washed down by bitter coffee, laced with a complex aftertaste. Any remainder wrapped in delicate vintage lace, placed inside a box, its blue gold insignia, tempering for future use. Lie within the caverns of my loins, rolled within a sleeping bag, stepped over, atop the blood burnished stones, eyes lowered, arm outstretched, to catch the scraps of knowledge floating down like an empty plastic bag tossed about by the wind. Close, but still too far to catch. Oxford time shimmies along, her private dance, twirling robes, delight up in sweeping up gold scattered by celebration. Glorious seconds mark cruel minutes and hopeless hours into condensed terms to fill years of longing. In my streets, the students come and go, eager to add to what they know. The quiet earth that feeds them, scores of apple orchard lines tracing my fall and vacant belly. From where my production spills out into the world, out from its bumpy, crowded core, into an eager reception who stand in awe of my streets. I'm an old woman, and so can tear off flesh, suck the end off the bone, suck out the marrow, leaving just a thin pointed strip with which to pick my teeth clean. Come, seek your comfort. My breast will nourish your mind. I'm an old woman. Inscribe what you will onto the yellow walls with wet fingers, tinged by the sweat of your hopes. Isis will lap them up and purr out your spirit's song. In my streets, the students come and go. Look how they show off what they know. Yet I have space for you all, the high, the low, minds, suits, brute force, folk who wake again and again to the beat of the term, silently keeping the machinery moving. Hit me. I might just make a sound. When people ask the question, what is it you do? I say, I research growing, and they go, oh. That's really interesting. But I know what they mean. What on earth is she saying? But smile, she seems keen. And I am keen because there are things human beings need to live and food's a basic necessity that Mother Nature can give. But it turns out that growing is something complex. You ask any gardener how the weeds get them vexed. You put a seed here and when a plant just pops up, a slug, bird or munchak comes to gobble it up. And now the climate's changing, the world's rearranging, it's summer in October and hailing in June. There's all these delegations who say human nations might live better on Mars or even the moon. But most are stuck, like you and I, in a city. Ours is oxen. We cannot afford to simply pack up and move on. We need a solution to plastic pollution and the ways in which that we lived that are wrong. So I'm going to share one of the tricky dilemmas that growing in cities we have to solve. We have the capacity to feed the whole city, but when you look at statistics, it really isn't pretty. Just 1% of food eaten in Oxford is grown here or a place called close by. It's a big issue, so my research is trying to figure out why. Because human beings and plants have always been entangled. But you know what? Human beings often get their priorities mangled. We think there's a division between us and them. The nature belongs out there. But in cities, <clears throat> or cities, they're seen as places of culture where humans reside. We seem to think that humans aren't nature and lots more besides. Yet every big event that's occurred across all the nations could not take place without plant participation. That's why I research a process called co-domestication. We try to control plants, but despite our indignation, they also control us. And this often leads to frustration. Let me give you an example to try and explain why. You'll never look at the plants the same way again. There's a powerful plant that's illegal to grow. You can even fall foul of the law if it's cutting you throw without due care or attention for the way it can spread. The government made a law. They want this plant dead. 
Last year, MPs called a meeting in our parliament. Thousands responded to the invitations MPs sent. Come and tell us stories of lives that have been completely destroyed by Japanese knotweed that brought the Victorian people such joy, but now raises tarmac and smashes concrete. This Japanese knotweed is impossible to beat. It can lower your house price by tens of thousands of pounds if they find just one plant growing nearby in the ground. It's an invasive alien species that deserves to die. But I think you know it's not that simple, and I'll tell you why. The plant has no legs and so cannot move alone. If you look into all of the places it has grown, it's humans moving soil from here to there while building houses and roads without due care. So this plant that was headed for the hangman's noose has been charged with acting in a manner that's loose. It's a victim of the way that us humans don't think about our effects of our actions or the price of our clout. It's easier to blame something that's seen as foreign and we human beings do it again and again. It means that instead of dealing with the real problem, we misinterpret the issue and get overwhelmed. So I research the ways in which we are all in the same boat, humans, animals, and plants. But I want to end on a happy note. See, I have a thought that some people say is banal. I happen to think cities are nature and actually can feed us all. I have found out that even with rural urban migration, us humans, animals, plants, we can all avoid starvation. You see, insects and plants actually know about this situation and they join us on all our journeys, get off at the same train stations. So in Oxford City right now, in comparison to all the surroundings, there's much more nature here and insects are abounding. There's more bees in Oxford than in the nearby villages. In cities, you can't spray mass pesticides that make all the bees die. And in cities, we like to plant flowers and such. It means that bees have more nectar and all that they can munch. But here's a strange one. Pollution that comes out of cars masks the smell of bees so their predators can't chase them far. See, the bees in Oxford City are living it up. And where there are bees, there are fruit trees. And don't worry, the plants will catch up. The apple trees in Oxford produce tons of fruit because of all the bees and other pollinators to boot. They can get all they need despite our hopeless greed. There's enough and there's more for us to eat and keep store in just one 10 foot row. It's possible to grow 20 kilos of food with seeds left over to sow. There's no reason that from season to season, all our families couldn't be fed. Just need to use our heads. And there's a lot more I could say about my work and its scope, but the clock on the wall says I have to stop now. So despite all the challenges, we'll make it somehow. If we keep on growing and carry on, there's plenty of hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, JC. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so now to follow that, we have the amazing Will Watson. So Will is here. He is um, someone who describes himself as having fled from training as a cardiologist in Cambridge with just a membership of the Royal College of Physicians in his back pocket to seek fame and fortune in Oxford. So he, here he is at Offbeat. After listening to a few research project pitches, he deliberately chose one that made the least sense to him, uh, describing himself as someone who likes a challenge and currently spends his days persuading people to lie in an MRI scanner while he feeds their hearts sugar to make them work better. Will will take us on a journey right now to see what is the point of, of your heart and the improbable things that win research funds and the truly bonkers world of MRI. So I, I'm intrigued, I'm sure you are. Welcome, Will. <laughs> Hello. So I'd like you to imagine something a little scary, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like you to imagine that your heart has gone wrong. It's a terrible thing, I know. The heart is seen as being very important. If someone doesn't have a heart, that's seen as being a very bad thing indeed. And people without hearts are often very cross or even very dead, which is something of an inconvenience to them. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Will Watson. I am indeed a cardiologist. I look after people with hearts. I look after people with bad hearts, very bad hearts, and people whose hearts are so bad they barely even have a heart at all, which, as we've covered, is quite a bad thing. Ladies and gentlemen, 
you're all probably quite lucky. You probably all have hearts that are good or fine or at least okay. But what if you didn't? What if you had a heart that was bad or rubbish or completely balls? Well, you'd probably go and get some help about it. You'd probably go and see someone. You might go and see a doctor or a nurse or at least a bus driver. And you'd say to them, can you help me? Can you do anything? My heart, it is all wrong. And hopefully they'd do something. They'd give you a medicine or take it out or at least give you a cheaper ticket. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, however, is that us doctors, we think we're very clever and we've decided in what ways your heart is allowed to be bad and what ways it's allowed to be fine. And the problem is if your heart doesn't fit into one of these predetermined ways in which it's allowed to be bad, then, well, it's not bad. And if it's not bad, I don't know. It's weird or fine, who knows? The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, us doctors, we don't do weird. Weird freaks us out. We don't understand weird, therefore we don't engage with it. There are treatments for bad, we can treat bad, but we can't treat weird. There are no treatments for weird. So if there are no treatments for weird, it's not bad. And if it's not bad, it must be fine. So people come to us and they say, doctor, I think my heart is bad. And we say, no, 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 we've done the tests. The heart isn't bad. And they go, does that mean it's fine? And we go, hmm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one thing, one challenge, one great deal in medicine is trying to work out how the heart works, how the heart takes energy, pumps it around the body and pumps it to the muscles and allows us to do things, allows us to enjoy life, allows us to run up hills and see pretty kittens. So we're left with this challenge. How do you work out which hearts are fine and which hearts are bad and which hearts are weird and which hearts are just a bit... Mm. Well, the heart, it has a strange reputation. It's this very enigmatic organ. It has this great emotional heft to it. I get a lot more out of public engagement talking about the heart than I would if I was talking about the spleen or the elbow or even the bottom. The heart is basically a pump. It just sits there pumping in and out, day in, day out. Pumping in and out, beat after beat. Kind of boring, really, isn't it? And the problem is we don't want to admit the heart's boring. We want to keep up the mystique that this heart is this glamorous, sexy organ. So we don't want to look at it too hard. If we're trying to work out if the heart is good or bad, or we just look at how strongly it beats. If it's beating strongly, then we know it's fine. If it's beating not strongly, then we know it's bad. But what about, or what about, or even what about, those things, they make up the numbers as fine, but they don't seem right, do they? They seem weird. So ladies and gentlemen, we need better techniques. We need to work out in what ways the hearts are weird to work out if they are indeed bad or if they're fine or if they're just weird. So we need big science machines, machines of science that are big. This is very helpful. Why is it very helpful? Because Researchers like me, we have to get research funding. Research funding is quite hard to come across. In the good old days, you'd just go and see the professor and you'd go, hello, sir, I'd really jolly well like to do some research. And he'd go, well, what do, you, what do you think you're going to do research in? And you'd go, oh, I don't know, sir, but I'm such a good chap. I've got a letter saying I'm a good chap in everything. Who wrote your letter? Sir David wrote it. Well, Sir David's a good chap. You must be a good chap. Oh, jolly good, sir. Thank you, sir. Why don't you go and establish the field of genetics? OK, sir. Cheerio. And lo, you would have half a million pounds and a lab and a research career. Unfortunately, now things are not quite so easy. All the low-hanging fruit's been picked, and just being a good chap doesn't really get you into research anymore. You need something far more impressive. You need the big science machine. Ladies and gentlemen, my big science machine is an MRI scanner. They're so big they occupy two rooms. That's certainly a big science machine. They make weird noises. They're full of maths and gas and electrics and science, and they were made in Germany, so they must be good. The best thing about them is they're so big and yet inside they're so very, very tiny. They're barely the size of a biscuit barrel. So I have to ask people to crawl inside the scanner and all they can do is breathe in and out. We can see the heart beating in and out. That's all we can do. We can't see anything else. This is a great disappointment to some of my colleagues who are attempting to research copulation. So we put the person in the big science machine. The big science machine is very scary. Why is it very scary? Because it uses magnetism. The MRI scanner is a great big magnet. How strong is it? It's three Tesla. How strong is three Tesla? Well, a magnet in a scrapyard works at one Tesla. That's strong enough to pick up a car. My magnet is three Tesla. That's strong enough to pick up a bus or a Tesla. 
So the person gets into the MRI scanner, which is at three Tesla, and at these magnetic strengths, weird things can happen. You have to consent people for strange stuff. You have to say to people, well, you might feel slightly dizzy, or you might get a little tingle down in your testicles, or maybe even you may experience some, some just very slight time travel. As the magnetic field gets stronger, things get stranger and stranger. At 16 Tesla, things can start to levitate. There's a great paper from Nottingham where they showed that they were able to levitate a frog using a 16 Tesla magnet. Can you imagine discovering that? Can you imagine being the guy who flipped the switch? <laughs> Keith, it's happened. Imagine being their boss coming and going, what the hell are you going? Oh my God, is that a frog on the ceiling? Imagine demonstrating it to the research panel. Ladies and gentlemen, So this is all very exciting. We're able to do, use the science machine and we can look inside people's hearts. We can see the chemical reactions occurring. We can work out how much energy the heart's producing. We can work out how it's using sugar, how it's using fat. We can work out if the heart is weird or good or bad. I can give funny drugs. I can make the heart speed up. The heart speeding up, as we covered earlier, is important if you want to work up, walk up a hill or see the fun cat. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting to the end of my set, but I'm starting to make a difference in this. We're seeing how giving sugar to the heart makes it feel better. It certainly makes me feel better, so it stands to reason that eating a bag of Skittles must make the heart feel better, doesn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, we're trying to find out how all this works, and slowly we're chipping away at it. Slowly we're trying to work out that the weird hearts are also bad, but they're not bad. They're just bad in a different way. I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost like I need a bigger vocabulary or maybe a bigger machine. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about the two-room machine. I'm not sure how much bigger that can get, but let's, let's see. Um, we're now gonna hear from another researcher called Deborah Cameron. Now, Deborah is Oxford's pr Professor of Language and Communication, and she's based in the faculties of Linguistics and English. As well as teaching and doing research, she regularly writes, broadcasts, blogs, tweets about language and linguistics for the wider public. Ten years ago, she discovered the joys of stand-up comedy, and she's since performed in pubs, at the Bright Club, after conference dinners, and on one occasion, when they couldn't find anyone famous, apparently, at a copy editor's banquet. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah also um, explores her bizarre encounters today with us today, um, with those who want, to, want her to police the English language and attempts to persuade them that while language is important, it's not a matter of life and death. So thank you, Deborah. Yeah, well, as Vicky says, I'm Debbie Cameron. I'm a linguist, a person who does linguistics, and officially, I'm Oxford's Professor of Language and Communication. So according to my uh, job contract, what I do is the same stuff that all academics do. I give lectures, I teach students, I do research. But after I got here, I did start to realize that I had other responsibilities that were never mentioned at the interview. I know I don't look like anything special, but actually, I'm in charge of the English language. <laughs> We all know that the English language was invented here in Oxford. <laughs> so if you, if you um, profess it here in Oxford, it's obviously your responsibility to take good care of it. And you find yourself becoming a kind of one woman supreme court whose job is to give authoritative rulings on all the arguments people have about English, um, you know, resolving their, their problems, even settling their bets. Now, it's really an awesome responsibility, and it is, for a linguist, a bit of an awkward one, because, to be honest, we're not very big on language policing. Our motto, our version of the, the doctor's Hippocratic Oath is, be descriptive, not prescriptive. But most people in the world don't know that. They think a linguist is a person who speaks 17 languages. So um, it, it doesn't stop them from contacting me from all corners of the earth, imploring me to use my powers to make the English language work the way they think it should work. 
Now, some of this is just low-level, entry-level pedantry. It's people wanting me to, you know, execute anybody who misuses the apostrophe or, or says literally when they mean the opposite of literally. Um, but other times, it can get really weird. It started to get weird very soon after I got to Oxford, when I, I wasn't really, I hadn't understood what my obligations truly were. I was sitting in my office at Worcester College one morning when there was a knock on the door, and when I opened it, I found myself looking at a man dressed up as a potato. Now, I wasn't expecting a potato. Potatoes are a bit like the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody really expects them. But I thought he must be one of those fabled Oxford eccentrics, and so I invited him to come in and sit down, which was, by the way, a big mistake, because among the many things you can't do in a potato costume is sit down. So instead, we stood up as though at some weird root vegetable-themed cocktail party, and I asked him what he wanted. He said he was on his way to a protest outside the offices of the Oxford English Dictionary in Walton Street. And he wondered if maybe I would like to come with him and lend my extremely weighty support. So I asked him what was the protest about. And he said, he explained, that he and his colleagues from the Potato Marketing Board, who knew, eh? That they were protesting against the presence in the dictionary of the term couch potato. <laughs> so I asked why, and he said, because it's unfair to potatoes. It implies they're unhealthy when, in fact, a potato has more vitamin C than an orange and more fiber than a bowl of porridge. Well, sadly, since I know what a dictionary is for, and also what a metaphor is, <laughs> it wasn't really a cause I felt I could get behind. And so I told this man to stop wasting my time and go away. I thought he was probably an isolated incident. As I say, I hadn't really at that point understood my responsibilities. But he wasn't an isolated incident. Because after that, the emails and the letters and the phone calls began. Once I got an anonymous letter written in tiny handwriting with a Swindon postmark. <laughs> Inside, it contained a message saying that I needed to set up a committee of experts to invent 500 new words for small nuances of thought and feeling. <laughs> the writer believed that English had recently fallen behind other languages in this regard and that by convening a committee, I would be able to, and I quote, give a steer to our national identity in these turbulent globalized times. <laughs> and then there was the man who phoned me up to tell me that he had discovered the precise linguistic triggers that cause people to switch off during business presentations. <laughs> And he wanted my help getting a patent for this discovery. <laughs> now, I have to say I was skeptical because I don't really think it's a mystery why people switch off in business presentations. <laughs> Most business presentations are just soporifically boring. But I decided I would humor him and I said, well, could you give me an example? Silence. What sort of thing are you talking about? What acts as a linguistic trigger? Silence. Finally, he said, I can't tell you. I can't. If I tell you, you'll just go out and patent it yourself. <laughs> Not everyone I hear from is a nutter. Some of them are just people trying to do their job under difficult circumstances. That's how I made the virtual acquaintance of the man who was the secretary to the American Association of Orchestral Tuba Players. And that man had a problem with which he desperately needed my help. For the previous 45 years, members of his association had been locked in an unending battle over whether people who played the tuba should be referred to as tubaists or tubists. 
1973, they had put this question to a vote. And it was a bit like Brexit. The tubist people very narrowly won the day. And you can see where that was coming from, right? They were arguing from what we linguists call the principle of analogy. If an instrument's name ends in a vowel, usually the rule would be you delete the vowel and add ist to make the name of the player. So it's not pianoist, it's pianist. It's not celloist, it's cellist, and so on. So it's not tubaist, it's tubist. But I think you can see the problem there. <laughs> And the other side, the people who lost the vote, were very insistent on this, that unlike chel or pian, tube is actually a word. <laughs> also, <laughs> there are exceptions. So for instance, it is oboist and not obist. <laughs> so the result of the vote was never fully accepted. It had grumbled on for all these years and finally, the tubaist contingent had got enough signatures on the ballot to bring the thing to a vote at the next annual general meeting of the Tuba Players Association. And the secretary was contacting me because he thought maybe they could resolve it once and for all if they only had a ruling from the person who actually rules the English language. <laughs> now, I took this very seriously. I thought about it. I looked up the history. And I carried out what we call acceptability tests with native speakers of the language. I said to them, if I said so-and-so is a tubist, what would you think? It turned out that nobody thought it had anything to do with playing the tuba. One person's answer was, well, is it like a cubist, only cylindrical? <laughs> On the other hand, people also thought that tubaist was a pretty silly word and unpronounceable to boot, as you might have noticed. So I came to a conclusion for once in my life. I thought, there is only one sensible answer to this question, and I gave that answer to the secretary. I said, I believe you should call yourselves tuba players. <laughs> and to my great surprise, he was mortally offended. <laughs> There they had been, debating the merits of tubist and tubaist for almost half a century. And now here I was coming in and suggesting that maybe that whole debate had been completely pointless. Who did I think I was? To which my answer could only be, well, who did you think I was? <laughs> because the moral of this story is really much more the Wizard of Oz than Superman. Nobody rules the English language. It will always vary and change. There will always be arguments about it. And we need to learn to live with that. Because yes, language matters. But no, it's not a matter of life and death. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Deborah. Um, so uh, we have another act uh, coming up now. You may have noticed that there is a lot of uh, musical instruments behind us. So uh, I'll just invite uh, the performers to just start setting up around me. And I will take this opportunity uh, to not only introduce them, but just to highlight, uh, you may be sitting on, or you may have picked up before you sat down, uh, a postcard. And what's really helpful for us is if you're able to take some time to fill that out, I appreciate it's dark. Um, I was tempted following uh, Deborah's piece to, you know, say your answer's on a postcard, tubist or tuberist, but we've got the answer, so, you know, leave that. Um, but it would be so helpful if you had time to fill that in. That would be great. JC has also added her postcard about her podcast series. And there is also a program for this next section. So uh, our next section is Paul Lodge and also the Flights of Helios Band. So Paul is a professor of philosophy and fellow of Mansfield College. He's been writing and performing songs for 30 years. And some of those songs we're going to hear tonight, which is great. Uh, he's here tonight accompanied by a local space rock psychedelic folk band, Flights of Helios. I'm excited. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so Paul is playing a selection of songs from Cantat Ergo Summus. Got to get some Latin in there somewhere, we're humanists. Um, so if you have a look at the programme, you'll be able to see a little bit more about that. Um, this is actually an ongoing project for Paul that combines his interests in philosophy and music and comprises of original settings of philosophical poems by uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Walter Benjamin and Ralph Waldo Emerson. All, all the words I could almost pr pronounce properly, but yeah, managed to get through that. Um, so I think that almost set up now. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also not only to thank uh, our performers tonight, but also all of you for coming. This means a huge amount to us. We're really grateful to the Offbeat Festival, uh, which, you know, particularly the Oxford Playhouse and the Arts of the Old Fire Station for facilitating all of this and creating an amazing set of events that we have been uh, so proud to be part of. So thank you all very much. Um, Paul, how are we doing? You good? We good, gang? Okay, great. So uh, please welcome Paul and Flights of Hellas. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, um, so yeah, this is part of a larger project. Um, there are about 10 songs all together, and your program has various bits of information, uh, particularly about the fabulous band supporting me, Flights of Hellas, um, and the words for the songs, which if you do want to sing along, you can, but obviously you can take them away and, uh, and look at them. Um, the first song that I want to do um, is called Zarathustra's Roundelay. It is by Nietzsche, a philosopher that many of you might have heard of. And it's from his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And it occurs twice. It occurs at the end of the book and it's, nobody really knows what Nietzsche he's talking about most of the time. This has got something to do with, he says it's got something to do with his famous thesis of the idea of the eternal recurrence of the same. Um, so you can go and look that up and then try and work out whether the words seem to speak to that for yourselves. Um, so as I say, it's called Zarathustra's Roundelay. I discovered um, after having set it, um, I mean, you may know that Richard Strauss wrote a famous tone poem called Thus Spek Zarathustra. But Mahler's Third Symphony also ends with a, a setting of, um, of this poem. It's quite different from, from our version. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with that and then two more songs. Um,
so um, we've got Vicky introducing tonight the person that we've we've worked a lot of us have worked with Hannah, um, who really put a lot of this together. I mean, Vicky obviously and other people involved. She's not here tonight. Um, she's at Glastonbury. Oh, yeah, these guys have played at Glastonbury. I mean, it's really she should have just just stayed here. But um, yeah. So um, anyway. There you go. Um, the next song we're going to do uh, slightly, slightly more rocky, I guess, in some ways. Uh, this is um, so. What I did here, there's, there's a, a guy called Walter Benjamin, you may have heard of, um, and he um, owned a painting by Paul Clay. He bought a painting called Angelus Novus when Clay painted it and kept it in his possession until he actually killed himself trying to escape from the Nazis. He got trapped on the Portuguese border, I think it was, and um, and then that drifted into the possession of another philosopher, Theodore Adorno, and eventually it, it ended up in a, in a museum. And it's a very famous painting in itself, in its own right. Um, Benjamin wrote a, a paper called Nine Theses in the Philosophy of History, and there's a description of this painting. Um, and this song is based on that description, plugged through a... Um, Google program, which does the kind of thing that people like uh, William Burroughs and David Bowie used to do, where they would use this cut-up technique, and they would cut words up and then st throw them around and then make songs out of them. And so that's that's what this is. I didn't literally cut them up. I let the computer do that. And so this is a kind of a cut-up version of the ninth thesis from Benny Means uh, thesis on the philosophy of history, and I've called it New Angel rather than uh, the Latin version. Towards the sun. 
That, but I think I still need to introduce the band. I mean, it feels like it's a bit early, but um, we've only got three songs. So, I mean, I'm so lucky to have these guys performing with me. Um, I've been writing songs for a long time, always doing them on my own. The idea of trying to find lots of people to work together seemed a huge challenge. Um, earlier in the year, we ended up on a bill for a, a show actually here um, in January. And then they were all kind enough to say that they liked the music and also to to learn my songs and, and perform with me tonight. And hopefully we're going to do a bit more of it in the future as well. So I'll go around. So we have Sean on violin, Pete back there on the drums, <laughs> Phil on the bass, Harriet on keyboard and what will be flute in a minute. Um, Chris, usually the, back, usually the vocalist doing backing vocals sitting in the background, which is very kind of into her. And then at the back, we've got James on the guitar. Um, and James will feature in this one um, in the middle. Uh, so this is actually one of the first songs that I really did uh, when this idea entered my head as a graduate student, that somehow there ought to be a way to combine philosophy with sort of some version of popular culture. Now, the idea that I would have any effect is, a, of course, another matter. But I, I found out about philosophy in the first place by doing things like watching Monty Python, by listening to, watching to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The way these philosophers' names just kind of percolated, not that it was didactic, and I, I've never wanted to do this in a didactic way, but if these names just went into people's heads and they became something that they were curious about, then I would have, will have, Succeeded. So the last one is based on a poem by Emerson called Brahma, um, a long, long time ago, as I say, about nearly 25 years ago. Um, I went on a journey. I was a graduate student in America. I took the Greyhound bus to Pittsburgh and then drove back through Pennsylvania, through New York, back to New Jersey. And when we were in New York State, going into um, sort of eastern Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, rather. Somehow this kind of, this feeling of the transcendentalists, um, the American transcendentalists, affected me, and I was very interested in their philosophy for a while at that point. So this is where, this is where that comes from. I put this, I found this poem and then set it to words. It's called Brahma, um, and again, there's a brief description of, of what it might be about in this program that we've given you. Um, I say thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope you've enjoyed the songs and I hope you'll enjoy this one as well. <laughs> Slays 
Pass the call lodge. Call lodge. Call lodge. Call lodge, ladies and gentlemen. Call lodge. All that's left for me to do is to ask if I may the other performers to join us up. We'll do one final bow and one final thank you to all of you for joining us this evening as well. Come and join us. Thank you.